Good day to you all and all. This is I, Justin Hawkins, and this is Justin Hawkins Writes Again, the podcast. Um, this week's topic is all about critique and criticism. Is it necessary? Why do people do it? How does it feel when it occurs to an artist and, what, uh, you know, all this sort of stuff. Um, this is a remote episode. It was recorded um, via a Zoom call between myself and my producer, Jenny May Finn. And as if to emphasise the remote nature of it, I've decided to record the introduction outside the airport here in uh, Mexico City. Um, anyway, you can also listen to this over on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. It's an interesting episode and I hope you enjoy it. Nice one, guys. Please do enjoy. Again. Good day to you one and all. It is I, Justin Hawkins, and this is Justin Hawkins Rides Again. The Jaws of Victory, Pitfalls of the Music Trade. Today I'll be talking to um, Jenny May Finn, my producer, the broadcasting legend that is Jenny May Finn, my produ- producer, producer, and uh, we're discussing criticism, but mainly within the realms of music, I suppose, or being an artist and yeah, how nice. to react and respond to criticism, what it means, how how it feels. Is it necessary? Is it what? Necessary. Yeah, we'll get into all that stuff. Shall I, shall I do the theme tune? Yeah. Justin Hawkins rides again The jaws of victory pitfalls of the music trade Episode 5 Criticism yeah. and critique. Yeah. And it's the first remote one, so who knows what it'll be like. Good. So uh, what are we talking about today then, Jenny? Are you being criticised as an artist and how you deal with it okay. and whether or not it affects you? Will this involve any role play? Will you actually really criticise I can. I can be really harsh if you yeah. want. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my voice went up then. Yeah, why not? That'd be good. Uh. Yeah. Yeah, okay, um, let's do that. Or I can be really nice. I have, okay, well, I guess the first thing is, is it necessary to critique music and artists? Why does it happen? Uh, do, is it not, I think it's necessary to critique and criticise music in order for there to be discussion around it. And discussion around it is a is its own sub industry underneath the music umbrella, isn't it? Like stuff like magazines. Yeah. Um, I don't know, and I suppose it's it's that discussion that generates um, the sense of ownership in your in your loyal fan base, and also gets people to ride into battle for you. I suppose as an artist, you know. Um, whether or not it's, criti- I mean, if critique was an essential part of the creation of music, I think you'd be asking, you know, a panel of journalists to listen to the music before you bothered to release it. I mean, if it actually mattered, you'd want to yeah. do that before you unleash it on the public, wouldn't you? I guess that's what the label does, right? Now, A&R people. Yeah, they like pre-critique, don't they? I think in Like a- the Lewis Capaldi thing. It's actually a good documentary. I don't know if you've watched it. No, I haven't seen it. Was that on Netflix? Yeah, I haven't finished it, but he's in the in the writing room with, uh, like, I think a manager and, like, two other songwriters. And I got angry. I was like, leave him alone. Yeah. Let him. He's clearly uncomfortable. They're like, we need another hit. or, And they're, like, chiming in with stupid little lines here and there. Like, oh, that's, you know, where people are big. I wouldn't be able to manage in that world. They're like, that's such a great line. Oh, it's so... It's not even profound. It's just it rhymes, or it doesn't even rhyme. <laughs> Can you give me an example? Was it somebody rhyming the word "baby" with "crazy" by any chance? That seems to be a common uh, one. I can't remember what the word is, but it's quite early on. Um, um, it's something about oh, "I'm the pretender," blah 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 blah. But anyway, because he's talking about what did they rhyme that with? I can't, I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> Probably nothing. No one rhymes anymore. Massive bender. No. <laughs> I'm a massive bender. I'm just a pretender. <laughs> You're a pretender. I'm a real bender. Like, not like. Probably not. It can like. be in your next album. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yeah. You know me so well. <laughs> um, and I don't know. They were just saying, oh, they were like, oh, that's not a hit, or that's a bit too sad, or it's a bit down. And it's like, well, that's what he's writing. He is sad. Capaldi makes or... sad songs, doesn't he? He's just a sad song singer. 
He says yeah. that himself as well. That's his whole marketing thing. He's a funny bloke from Scotland that does sad songs. And yeah, but they just kept. I met, I don't know. You could just see his face and all these. And then he met like the label or one of the publishing people, and they're like, "Can we hear anything yet?" And he's like, "No." And then they like he's they're just. I don't know. Just it must be horrible. You write a song and then you play it, and everyone's like. It must be so demoralising. Well, I always think that about a particular kind of pop writing. I mean, if the, if the, I think if the objective of writing a song is to have a hit, especially a follow up hit when you've had what can only be described as an unexpected success. Yeah. You know, then I think what happens is everyone thinks they understand the sort of, what the part of the formula that made the previous thing successful um but the, but it's n- but nobody's ever right about that you know because things capture the zeitgeist for lots and lots of different reasons and stuff's successful because of a combination of like the charisma and uh, you know the the compositional nous of the person that made it the production the moment in time that you release it and all these you know so many different parameters and factors that you have to think about and you'll never achieve the same thing twice i mean even if you've released like what was his big song again the one about someone someone you loved or someone i love yeah someone you loved i was getting kind of used to be somebody you love oh yeah oh and even in the writing room he was he played one of the hits and he goes that sounds a bit like and the writer goes, that's great. Everyone just likes listening to the same stuff. I was like, is that the objective? <laughs> just like a slight, yeah, that's what he said. He was like, people love that. People love listening to the same stuff or stuff that sounds like other stuff. I was like, Who are these you're f***ing writers that he's working with? You're like epitomizing what's wrong with the music industry. Is, and I'm guilty of it too. I love, I, I listen to the same song probably I yeah, times. You consume music like uh, like a nine year old girl consumes music. Oh yeah, like you know that Paloma Paris or Paris Paloma song. Definitely a hundred times I've listened to that song. No, every every lyric, and because it just riles something up in me, and then I I ruin a song, and then I move on. With 1975, it was their song, "Love Me." I can sing, sing that every lyric in that song, and then I'm like, then I'm satisfied, and then I move on to the next song. <laughs> but that one lasts for ages. But that's probably not the best way. Uh, you know, that's actually a bit to do with how people can consume music now anyway, isn't it? You know, like I used to listen to albums. I remember Aerosmith Pump came out. I knew every song back to front. I knew I knew about the gaps in between the songs as well. I knew exactly when the next thing was going to start. Um, I would play it beginning to end, and that's just how how I used to do it. But now I don't think I do. Like if I think if Aerosmith released a record that I was interested in now, I'd skim through it, find my favourite track, and I'd play that to death. Yeah. And maybe I'd explore <laughs> the others as well. But I just, even I don't consume music in the same way as I used to. And I'm in a band that actually makes albums. <laughs> you know, I don't expect people to listen to them. You never do. But yeah, maybe it's because their things are focused on the hits, so maybe everyone just ends up not making the rest of the songs as good. Even in like a, a band like Aerosmith, or even especially a band like The Darkness, you're not anticipating a hit, and we're definitely not writing to try and have a hit, but there's just your favourite one. You know, everybody has their favourites, don't they? Oh, there's one skippable. There's sometimes, I got really into the 1975 for the first half of this year, and I was listening to the albums in full. In the bath. Were you doing it in sequence? No, I chose. It was a, a brief, blah 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 of online relationships. A brief inquiry of on it. I listened to that in the bath a lot, and that has loads of weird tracks on it too, like just instrumental electronic stuff. And I just really enjoyed it. I, I, there, and he definitely writes his music, so it's is some sort of cohesive narrative, even in the album, even if you don't know what it is. Like there are albums that you listen to, and they're, 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 those fans listen to those albums in full. The 1975 fan base is a cool fan base. <laughs> I think they're really. Amazing. But do you think that um, so Lewis Capaldi is sort of being bullied a little bit? I guess he's just representing what most artists go through, right? But uh, uh, but getting back to Aerosmith, and I know I keep talking about Aerosmith, but there's a documentary called The Making of Pump. Do you ever see that one? And there's a bit when they're they're listening through to some tracks with, uh, I think it's John Kolodna, um, who was uh, their A&R person at Geffen Records. And he's sitting there all beardy, high and mighty, listening to these tracks. And he says says things like, um, 
Um, you know that one that goes, um, there's a song on there. Don't get mad, get even. You know that song? Yeah. So he's listening to that and, um, and he's like, um, <clears throat> the way he's describing the shortcomings of their approach to that song is like, he says, okay, the, the riffs are there, the melody's there, it's all good, but lyrically, you haven't got it right. Okay. And it's, that's, that's how he puts it, like, you haven't got it right. <laughs> implying... There's a right way. Well, implying that they've got it wrong. <laughs> and it's like, it's fucking Aerosmith. How can you walk into this? How can you walk into Aerosmith studio and tell them they're fucking doing their music wrong? It's Aerosmith. I know people. I was thinking of that. Like people have take such liberty to tell artists how to be. But like, I think in those days, like that's that's the late eighties. So you're talking about um, a period of time when A and R men really were earning their crust. You know, because I think. Th- to be able to sort of um, justify your position, you've got to be selling millions of records and you have to have the confidence of, of having made big decisions on huge selling albums to walk into Aerosmith's studio and do that. I don't think I've ever met an A&R person that would have that sort of, um, that would command that sort of respect, <laughs> even in the darkness. <laughs> like if somebody walked into a darkness recording session and said something like that, they'd be told to f- or, or they'd just be ignored, you know. They say, oh, that, nobody ever tried with us, and maybe that's why we didn't, no, have, didn't have that much success, you know. Did you have an A&R person? Yeah, we always had... Um, I think we had some scouts that were following us around, but but when, on the first record, we more or less gave them a record. Like Permission to Land was a record that we'd already done ourselves, and really the only sort of A&R, um, A&Ring that happened in that instance was like... Um, some A and R people sitting around in a boardroom. We played on the record, and they're like this. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Mm. Just pretending to groove on it. And I was looking at them, thinking, "This must be what it's like when you're making sensual love to a person that's pretending to enjoy it." <laughs> you know, it's not not that any of us have ever experienced something like that. Of course, you're like, this sounds really familiar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this reminds me of most of my. I just, I mean, it, it, no, but it's like. Uh, no, but it's like. Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> There was just such a hollow insincerity about the way they were reacting to the music. But at the same time, half the campaign had been done, the album was ready to go, it had been mastered, and there was really nothing that anybody could say or do to change it at that point. It was, it was ready to be... I think they might have, it might have already been in manufacturing at that point because a lot of them came out with, with, the, with different sort of um, lo- label imprints on because we signed our record deal so close to releasing the album that there wasn't really any need for A&R input. You know, and it was too late for them to do that anyway. Um, we did have A&R people after that. Um, what about one-way ticket? We, uh, I was editing <laughs> that episode today. I knew you don't like the songs, but did anyone else go, I don't like these songs? Or did they go, yeah, we love these songs? I think um, for at that point, it was just like, let's get it over the line. <laughs> let's get it done, you know. <laughs> well, how long did it take you to do that? A year? Well, we were, to all intents and purposes, the writing and recording process took allegedly a year. We weren't in the studio for a whole year, though. You know, there was more like sessions sporadically laid out in between parties. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it wasn't. Um, we weren't functioning as a as a as a sort of um, familial unit on that record. Um, I think that. Also, having had all that success for the first record, we we actually had a lot of power because they weren't expecting it, and you know anything that the darkness did that yielded cash would was surprising and welcome. So they they were quite happy for us to sort of call the shots. Really, they they liked some of the songs for sure, and saw them as um, being single worthy and and stuff, and were happy. To Those singles did do well, though, didn't they? Yeah, well, they did, did really well. Some of them are top ten, I think, but it's all right. I mean. Not bad for for what we actually are, you know. But I do think that's the the point I made about. Um, I think it was in was it in the Lewis Capaldi episode anyway. I was I was talking about it'd be really cool if uh, so that you know so that a band can get the sort of momentum that you need over over a multiple album, you know, after over multiple album cycles, write a brilliant album acknowledge that it's a brilliant album and then shelve it then do another one and put that one out first 
Yeah, but though is, do you think people become get success because the album's so good or the songs are so good that if you released something that was slightly less good, people would just you wouldn't make it now. People would be like, uh. no. Um, I don't know because I think it's. I mean, even since then, the, the music industry's changed so much that um, criticism and and critique. Uh, from an A and R perspective, is irrelevant, um, and or or at least it pales into insignificance compared to what your social media numbers look like. Yeah, I saw someone on TikTok say that they were in a meeting and a load of A and R people got like ripped to shreds because someone was like, "What do you even do? You just look at at, social, at the people on social media, and then they're doing your job for you." <laughs> they're like, oh "God, no." Yeah, but it used to be like A and R people. Like scouts would take what they consider to be an exciting band with a movement behind it and some, something stirring up, you know, something that had potential to change stuff. They'd take that to their bosses and their bosses would go, OK, this is worth a punt. Let's get them on a development deal or we'll, we'll, we'll go in with a low ball offer and see if they want to work with us. And then the A&R people, the, the actual artists and repertoire folk would put them in with writers or the producers or they'd monitor their progress and chime in where necessary and help develop the band so that when their first album comes out, they've had a hand in that and, and like the, the risk that they've taken on this artist, um, they've actually you know, doubled down on their investment by putting some time into it as well. And it isn't like that anymore. They will not even look at you unless you've got something happening on social media. So there's no risk to be done. Like this, like if the numbers are there, they know that they'll put something out and it will get streamed a lot because you've got a lot of followers. Um, so where is the, where's the necessity for critique and criticism in that instance, I wonder? I don't know. I mean, I don't know which is better. I mean, I guess the, the democratic way is the social media way, because the other way is uh, someone you know has put, let you play in their venue and told someone else to come along, and then it's more nepotistic. Nepotistic, nepotistic yeah. You um, mean it's about who you know, not what you know? Well, it's about who you... You're just given opportunities, because even inviting someone to a show, because that might have been the only way YouTube wasn't around... They'll go, well, I'll get the A&R guy or the scout to come down because you're my friend. And it Rather used to be like um, you'd have to do music industry showcases in the midweek. And you know that nobody's going to go out to a, see an unsigned band in the midweek that's got nothing going on. But they'd, you'd play and then music execs would show up and they'd see each other there and they'd go, hang on a minute, I better yeah. sign them before they do. You know? yeah. <laughs> and so like your manager's job was to get everybody in the room so that when you play these shitty songs you know the whole tray's looking at you going hang on a minute i only want this because the other person wants you and they and he sort of create a fake demand by doing that so so in fact your manager's only role really is to, um the gatekeeper yeah i suppose well, but more like just having a, a really impressive roller decks of uh, yes. music industry executives and then if you play at the weekend then you're only doing that for the music or for to for your fans or to build your audience because nobody from the music trade is going to go to a gig on a Saturday or a Friday because no. they're all, they all used to be in the countryside shooting grouse or whatever it is they do. I wonder if there's so, ever been a demo that's blown somebody away though. I don't know. Well, your one must have. Well, naturally. <laughs> but that's how you guys got it, right? But now it's more democratic, I guess, and people hate social media, but if you garner an audience on there, it's probably because they like what you're doing not because they're being told by someone who wants to make money from you to like them yeah so social media is the word of mouth type thing isn't it i mean when we got signed i think it was the, the main one of the main reasons why the boss of atlantic was considering us was because his daughter told him that we were cool cool <laughs> and and we had you know so that that was the so there was a little bit oh, i think i have yeah on many occasions um so I think that there was a combination of nepotism and sort of word of mouthery uh, and also because there was a bit of competition for our recording stuff back then, probably a bit of one-upmanship between them and the other labels that were interested at the time. Yeah. We've kind of gone off critique, haven't we? But uh, we have, we have. Sorry, yeah. <laughs> Getting into the, <laughs> the history of the music trade. <laughs> but... No, but the thing is, like, because but we were talking about that in the context of A and R. Yeah. 
artist and repertoire, the, the division of uh, a music label that's de designed to develop and hone um, and advise and guide artists when it comes to their product, like the, in terms of their what they're releasing, when they're releasing it, and just, yeah, strategizing the output, really, isn't it? That's what A&R people do, isn't it? Right. Well, you know more than me. I haven't been. Anywhere. I don't know what they fucking do. It's just, <laughs> just show up and say, "Oh, I want to sign you. Like yeah, here's some money." <laughs> like if it sounds like the most like easy, not easy, but fun job, where you just go hang out with artists all the time. I think it is, but there's a lot of pressure as well because you can't hold on to a gig like that unless you're signing stuff that becomes successful. Because yeah. you just become like associated with failed investments, you know. So you've got to have stuff yeah. that, that flies, and you, so you do have to understand what the wider audience is likely to do. You know, you look at a, um, a Wikipedia entry of somebody who's like a, a a high level executive in a publishing or a, or a record company and has been for a long time. You'll see all the stuff that they've signed and the stuff that they've brought in. It'll be big stuff, and it'll be like a proven track record of knowing what's going to sail. Um, and it'll be stuff that they've taken a chance on that nobody saw coming, you know, um, and became huge. And that's how yeah, that, that's what cements your reputation for understanding what what the what the you know the population at large is going to enjoy listening to. It yeah. is a talent. Well, when you write a song, are you scared about what people will think of it? <laughs> um. I think uh, I think you mean what do you mean like when you first when you at the, at the point of writing it you mean well no the, the first time that you write it and then you're like oh I'm going to send it to someone to listen to okay um you used to send me loads of stuff but that was probably just when I when I write a song um I share it with somebody Mm. And I send it, and I'm not doing that with any sort of fear of uh, criti criticism or, or not in hope of some critique. I just share it, and then the act of sharing it uh, ignites something in me, and I know in my heart whether what I'm sharing is good or bad. Yeah, I remember there was one you shared, and then you're like, no, I don't like this. Immediately after, and I was like, it was like, it was kind of like an operatic -y one, and you're like, no, it's not quite right. Yeah, because I could feel it when I sent it. Um, <laughs> so I think um, that's something to do with um, probably the supreme confidence <laughs> that I have. Like I'm not, I don't, I don't really, I don't care if anybody else likes it, but I care about how I feel when I play it to them. If you see what I mean. Yeah, I have a secret account, a secret burner account a what? to get my singing beer. Oh, that's a good idea. Uh, and What's and the login? I, oh, no. <laughs> and then I post it and then I see how I feel. And sometimes I'll delete it and sometimes I'll leave it up. Mm. And I am terrified that someone's going to go, oh, you're just shit. <laughs> you you realise that I, now you've invited everybody to try and find this thing. It's fine. Some people already found it. Um mm, um, and then sometimes if someone says something nice, I don't believe them. <laughs> someone was like, oh, your voice is nice. I'm like, I think you're lying. I think you're just being nice. Well, so, I prefer nuanced comments rather than praise. You should have panned that piano part a little bit further out because then otherwise no, it's sort of overpowering. Not recorded in that way. They're just like phones. One person said, you have a really unusual voice. And I was like, I trust that person because that could be taken either way. <laughs> so I feel like they've thought about it. They've reacted in a way. Okay. Maybe they, that's they the didn't opposite. do that Maybe thing of like saying, pain. they didn't do that thing of saying, you have a very unique voice, did they? No, they said unusual, so it was a bit more like, oh, well, then it made me go, What's, well, I've got a weird voice. Everything about, why is everything about me unusual, <laughs> including my voice? Yeah. I mean, I suppose they could have used the word like distinctive. I prefer unusual, I think. Distinctive comes like sound like, like some sort of foghorn. <laughs> <Huh>? <laughs> well... But a voice that sounds like a foghorn is indistinct, 
Among, but what about among you? Your voice is different than other people's voices. I hope. So. I would hope so. Yeah. But were you ever worried about people critiquing it, or saying, or people when people go because you know when someone's famous, someone always goes, "I don't like that." There's always going to. I feel like anytime someone says something's good, there's always going to be something someone that says it's bad. I think. Um, obviously, I've had a lot of criticism in in both directions, actually. Um, but the thing about voice, my voice is, it's like there's there's not much I can do about that. You know, I'd be like criticizing my the the space between my eyes or something like that. You know, it's just something that I've. That's what I got. I used to get picked on. For right. That. Well, you know. So, th but that's something that you're powerless to change. So. I know it feels worse. Does it though? <laughs> yeah. Well, if somebody says they don't like the distance between your eyes, it's like, well, that's They're it. Like, go oh, and, go and look at somebody <laughs> else's. Go and look at the gap between somebody else's eyes then. Because I can't change that. You know. <laughs> Yeah, I prefer if someone, like if someone said, I don't like your T-shirt, I'd be like, I'll just get a new T-shirt. No, you won't. <laughs> just wear the T-shirt and I fuck could, them, who cares? I, I could get a new T-shirt, but if someone says, like, I don't like your voice, and then you want to be able to sing because you like singing, and then you're like, oh, I can't, it's just horrible on people's ears. But it's not, it's one person who doesn't like your voice. Yeah, I know. I'm just saying, if, like, does it not, is it not hard to take? I don't like, I remember there's a funny thing that you sent me. There was a you sent me a, a um, screenshot of <laughs> somebody that was saying if somebody when when people level a criticism at, at an artist that they are a one hit wonder, yeah, and then that that person's like, well, I'd be walking around saying, well, fuck off, you no hit cunt. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I think you said like swinging his cock around singing. Yeah. <laughs> what, what was the freight? What was the thing you said? He's, I'll try to find it, but I that think it's really it. funny. I didn't know that you you never responded to that thing. I think I was allowing it to sink in because I, I thought I felt like you were criticizing oh, me for being a one <laughs> one hit one. No, oh no, I know I was nervous about sending it, but then I was like, this is like we both know people have leveled at you. Yeah, so. yeah. Yeah. And then, then there's people that go, well, it wasn't really a hit, was it? I mean, I don't even like that song. It's like, well, you fucking know that song to be able to offer an opinion of it in the first place. And I was thinking recently, most people don't have hits. Their just song is famous for a while and then it goes away. Yeah. Like, it's like number one, but is it a, a hit, like a perennial hit? Is that a thing? Perennial. Hit. Yeah, I think it is. <laughs> I mean, like most, is it going to be sang a karaoke that's basically if your song's a hit or not. Will cover bands want to put it in their set when they're playing in pubs? Yeah. Or can people sing along to it? Let's get back to the um, criticism critique thing. Do you think what I do is necessary? Like when I'm reacting to songs and criticising or critiquing? I think you're unique because you say nice things. Not always. I Sometimes I say, I said that... Um, what was his name? The Post Malone. I said that his song just sounded like some wet indie. Yeah, but you said some nice. Yeah, that's true. I don't know if it's. Ne I don't think it's necessary, but I think people enjoy finding out whether or not you like something. But this, I think this is like I think um, stuff that reviews well in a magazine, like for example, the New Musical Express. <laughs> Part of the fun is. The pros of, uh, you know, how they've written those articles, really. It's nothing whatsoever to do with the music that's happening. Yeah. It's about how they express their opinion of it. And that's, I'm sure there are people that, that read the New Musical Express and don't listen to any of the music that they're talking about. Because a lot of the stuff they talk about is f***ing dog shit. You know, it always used to be, anyway. I, just, I used to sort of look at the bands that they were covering and think, well, these bands are all shit. They're all rubbish. Yeah. But people buy that magazine. It can't be because they think the music good, because you know nobody's that, you know, nobody's that daft, surely. Yeah. Well, it's like Pitchfork or like the arbiters of good music. Now, okay, aren't they? yeah. So the enemy's gone now. So it's Pitchfork. Um, and I did find one of your. I did look up the review they did of Permission to Land. Actually, um, <laughs> oh, I've also got the Guardian one as well from when it came out. God, here we go. Do you want me to read some of it? Yeah, yeah, and I'll react to it open-heartedly. <coughs> the darkness takes 
The Darkness take as their starting point the 1970s incarnation of ACDC when Bon Scott was screeching at the helm. Okay, well, to be honest, I'd, I'll stop you there. Yeah. That's a fair point. Okay. It's the best era of rock music for me. Yeah, I was just going to say. It's the best. This, this why, would you, why would you take anything else as your, as your foundation? Yep. What else are you going to do? <laughs> like base it all on the Choir Boys second record? Of course not. Go on. <laughs> they, dress, they dress it up with Sladeish leopard skin. Mm, none of us have uh, ever listened to Slade apart from me and my brother and Frankie. And, and then they say, and, well, that's it. Oh, wow. <laughs> Their lack of... Who wrote this? I'm going to kick the shit out of him. Caroline Sullivan. <laughs> oh, that shit. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, she said you like Bon Scott. That's the coolest one. Yeah, ben, I mean, Bon Scott, that's all you need. Yeah. Slade, though. <clears throat> I know. It's just factually, factually wrong. Are you ready? I'm ready. Go on. Yeah. Their lack of subtlety, sophistication, or sense has got up noses, but who would you rather watch? The real ACDC still out there doing the same old, same old, or these entertaining young bucks? Young. I like that. I know, you weren't that young, were you? Okay, I'm, well, gonna write, I'm gonna write down that young. <laughs> so they said, why bother listening to ACDC? Who are st we're still touring only just a few years ago. 2003 would have been just after the stiff upper lip ACDC stuff. So I guess it probably was wasn't when they're in their pomp. That's actually oh. that's ACDC when they were, when they started to be the blues rock, doing the blues rock stuff. Yeah, but I guess they'd still play the other stuff. If you saw them live. Yeah, definitely, undoubtedly, yeah. Okay. It's not as if they'll be impinging on our consciousnesses, consciousness for longer than a few seasons anyway. This sort of spoofery has inbuilt obsolescence. Oh. How does that make you feel? Do you feel like it? Um, basically, she's saying that we only copied two things. And she's wrong about the second thing that we copied. The second thing that we copied was Queen. Yeah, no, I never really saw that much Slade references. Slade thing is just like, uh, okay. If the Chris, like, if she I think that's the something that I mean, I mean Slade is is like, um, what's the word? It's a, uh, it's one. It's people use that euphemistically to to basically say that something's shit, you know, huh. or looks what's a bit that? silly, you know. It's kind of like. The working man's glam, isn't it? That's what Slade is, right? I mean, hmm. I don't know. Okay, I'm going to go on. At a compact 38 minutes, permission to land is over before it gets irritating. That's mean. Uh, leaving you with an impression of overwrought headache rock fronted by a gale force falsetto. Gale force? Yeah, I'll, I'll have that. <laughs> The ladder belongs to the darkness's primary weapon, Justin Hawkins. Primary weapon, who... eh? Nice. <laughs> Are you going to make a joke about your primary weapon? No, <laughs> I'm, I was going to say I'm glad she didn't say... Dan? <laughs> uh, who treats every track as an invitation to swing, vocally at least, from the chandeliers? Among the more delightful, ludicrous moments are the operatic I Believe in a Thing Called Love, Why Don't More Tunes Incorporate Yodeling? Don't you? Yeah. No, I think that's a fair point because because I go from full voice to an octave leap in a couple of places. Is it? Yodeling? And then if you do that with a, with a clumsy break, then it can sound a bit like yodeling. That's more or less what yodeling is. Yeah. I think it's a fair point. Okay, the thuggishly heavy "Love on the Rocks" and the apoplectic power battle ballad <laughs> holding my own. Excellent fun. That was it. Mm, it's all right. The review. Yeah, not too bad, is it? Yeah. How do you feel when you read reviews? Are you like? Does it hurt your feelings ever? <laughs> um, or do you just get angry? You tend to get angry. When yeah, I do get angry. Done. But, I, you know, to be honest, I always think that even a review where somebody's saying something nice, I always think, well, it's good that it's nice, but at the same time, the things that people like about it aren't the same things that I like about it. So I still think it's wrong in a way. You know, like even if that if that person had said like, uh, "Oh, 
this brilliant album that sounds just like the best bits of Slade. I'd be like, it doesn't sound anything like Slade, you fucking idiot. You know, even though they're saying something nice, I just completely disagree with the the reference that they make and don't don't hear that as an influence at all and just uh, and just reject it as just some more words really but i think um conversely when they say something i don't know if they say something mean it's just like oh, that's not very nice <laughs> but does it make you doubt does it make you doubt yourself does it ever honestly make you doubt yourself? Maybe it does. I don't know. I think back then... I mean, if you back take then, away... Back then it used to make me angry because I was actually doing something creative and trying to get on, you know. And I, and I hate it when you see, like, a, when, you're, when you're up and coming or if you, you see an up and coming artist and somebody starts slagging them off, it's like, well, you're potentially... Like, if some people are, like, looking at that review and then they're going, oh, I'm not going to give this a chance now because that person said that. That that makes me really angry because it's like, first of all, don't even agree with what they're saying. And I, and it feels like there's something else behind the reason why they're saying it. And yet it might turn people off before they've even heard us, you know, which I think is really unfair, you know. I mean, it's, I suppose people say that thing about the, no publicity is bad publicity. Is that what they say? All publicity is oh, good publicity. Oh, yeah, that's what they say, yeah. I don't know if it is, to be honest. No, I don't think it is. Um, if somebody's just saying there's a bloke screeching all the time, he wears, he wears, um, he looks like he's in Slade, or whatever it was. <laughs> I don't know. I've forgotten it now. Yeah, but like, did you? If you'd get a like, remove your angry hard shell of the public, you know, where you're angry and you don't care, you don't care what people think. Does it ever make you feel a bit sad and doubt yourself and think? Oh. No, it makes you sad because it's like the things that we're actually trying to do have just washed past that person we haven't made it we haven't connected with somebody who's obviously an intellect you know um we're doing we're definitely doing stuff that's daft but in a savanty way isn't it i mean it's like it's daft for a reason yeah i'm not even talk, talking about people saying oh, it's silly i just mean if someone goes up oh, it's just shit like the music's not good and it, you know his voice is horrible and i'm not and i don't like it I, don't, I really don't know. Because you know the way... Uh, Back then, I definitely cared. But now, I don't... I honestly don't read reviews unless somebody sends one to me and says, oh, you should read this, it's really good. And then I read it and go, yeah, it's really good in places. Yeah. But I'm more talking about back then when you were critiqued and you actually were absorbing the critique. Well, it, I think it matters more when... That's what I'm saying, I suppose. At that time in your career, it does actually matter. You know, not just in terms of, like, how it's going to impact your ability to grow an audience, but also how it makes you feel about your own art and what you're doing. I mean, I, d I don't actually remember that review. What, what, what was that again? Is that The Guardian? It's The like Guardian, yeah. Yeah, they gave you four stars out of five. Out of five. That's not too bad, is it? No, it's pretty good. I mean, yeah. But maybe I mean, there, was a t there was a time in my life when, like, when like um, after the, um, when I was doing Hot Leg, um, and I, Hot Leg was one of those things where I wasn't playing by the usual rules, you know. I did, I, I, when, when somebody did a shitty review, I um, modified it for, for my own use <laughs> and then put it out on my website so like um there was one bloke who thought he was being really clever and it said um he said uh he said fans of the darkness will probably enjoy this um, but everyone else will give hot leg the cold shoulder and i changed it um in photoshop so i, I scanned the <laughs> scanned the newspaper article and then i moved some of the letters around so it said fans of the darkness will probably enjoy this but everyone else will too <laughs> and then I just uh, changed it from like what three stars or whatever it was it'd given me to ten stars. <laughs> I remember your weird MySpace Tumblr era. <laughs> I love that. And then the other th the other thing that was funny, like somebody said, uh, 
on the hot leg, um, somebody reviewed hot leg and mistakenly called me Justin Hayward. Who's the guy I was fucking named after? I'm not that old, you know what I mean? And then, uh, <laughs> so then, um, I changed the name of the of the band on MySpace to Justin Hayward's Hot Legs. <laughs> <laughs> I guess. Uh, no, I don't think I was really trying at that point. But I think earlier on, uh, earlier on, I did, I did really. Um, I thought people, because I genuinely thought that what we were doing would be exciting to folk. You know, it's like, how can you walk around writing about all that fucking bullshit music that was around when we came along and actually be excited about it? And I thought we would come along and we'd be like, oh, at last, there's somebody doing something that's actually kind of fun, you know but they were trying to shoot us down in a lot of instances and that that was hurtful because we were all we were trying to do was make people happy that really was it you know do you think being in a band though is slightly different than maybe if you're a solo artist because you're in it together kind of like if you're uh, if you're a solo artist it's all you rather than a c conglomeration of multiple people's ideas band is operating like the gang or the family that that it usually is at the beginning then you can ride it out and support each other through it. I definitely think it's harder for solo artists. Do you think maybe, because usually that sort of critique of people saying something shit is usually the bigger that band. Like Coldplay are always, you know, people are like, oh, Coldplay are shit. It's because they don't care because they know millions of people say they're good. If you know what I mean? Like if you wouldn't say it to an artist who's like not that well known, if you said, oh, you're just shit actually be quite cruel wouldn't it yeah it would and i, I did that once as well like um somebody said, somebody was on a on a uh, probably a youtube video of, of a darkness video or something said something shitty so, and i made a mistake of reading that comment and i went and looked at their thing and it was them doing like some cover versions and they fucking were shit so i said to him how can you come on my thing and and you know, in the comments, how can you come on my thing and say that we're shit? You're fucking shit. Look at this. You're never going to go anywhere. And then they were really upset. It's like they, they thought I was bullying them because of my status and my following and all that sort of thing. It's like, well, if you can't take it, then don't dish it out. No, yeah. Don't don't come to me saying, yeah, if you can't, don't. Uh, what, what, it's always the other way around. It's always like, oh, you should be the bigger man. Like, so you should shut the fuck up if you can't take it. No, that I think that's fair enough. I think if you're going to go around telling people they're shit and you're actually shit you know that's different but i'm talking about someone who's just earnestly going out there trying their best and then people are like oh they've got no talent they're not going to go anywhere and it's just this poor person just trying their best like if someone's just trying their best do they really deserve criticism yeah i mean especially if it's um like one of those artists that exists because of the catharsis of creating stuff not everybody is ambitious you know like i don't think like A and R and the critique that's necessary to to grow a band to elite kind of stadium level worldwide mega hit band, that's um that's not everybody's goal. Some people just want to make interesting music. Some people just make music because they have to, you know, as part of their I don't know personal growth or whatever, or because of you know dealing with stuff, the catharsis of songwriting. It's that, isn't it? Some people do that. Well, it must be hard if you put stuff that's really like vulnerable out and then people are like, that's not very good. But then really, maybe you don't care because it's actually what's real, if you know what I mean. Yeah, but for people to actually feel like they're obliged to offer an opinion in that unsolicited way, it has to have had some exposure. And I think some of the thing that informs that kind of criticism is like, they're exasperated with being forced to endure the music that they wouldn't necessarily choose to listen to. Yeah. So they're expressing like something, some of, some other kind of frustration about how music is plumbed into their lives when they don't necessarily want to hear that. That probably happens yeah. less now with Spotify because you listen to whatever you want to, don't you? Yeah, but the algorithm monitors what type of music you listen to and then feeds you more of it. Or there's something like too, I don't know. There's too much music. But Elizabeth Elizabeth Gilbert is um, an author. She's really, she talks about creativity in a really cool way. She talks about it as a dance rather than, I think I told you that before, rather than a, a battle. And she says the male men often talk about their creative process as a struggle, like they need to battle their creativity and win it over, where she sees it as like a dance where she's inviting her creativity to collaborate with her or whatever. But she says that she wrote a book, like a whole book, and then the publisher was like, 
or so I don't know if it was a crit- critic or a publisher when the book's fine, but like all all of her characters are incredibly one dimensional. <laughs> And she's like, what? And then she read it back a while later and she's like, they were right. <laughs> they were right. My characters weren't developed correctly and there's something in me that wasn't developing this right. And she took the criticism and then wrote a better book the next time. She actually like processed it. Okay, but let's let's go back to the review then and then look at the criticism and let's let's look at a positive way that I could improve what I do based on what that fucking ignorant so. I think the Pitchfork one might be better because pitch, Pitchfork do like more detailed ones don't they a bit too long but okay Pitchfork they gave you 8.4 out of 10 That's very very level. specific um, they gave you 6.5 for one way ticket just so you know okay that's cool a large portion of my audience has already decided that they, they just might hate the darkness I hope not because making snap judgments, especially ones based on anything except, you know, what's coming out of your speakers and whether or not it engages you, seems like a bit of a foolish thing to do. If you're, con- if you're that convinced that the darkness are a bad post-pomo joke, unfairly unleashed on the world, turn back now, listen to the new books album and feel safe in the knowledge that most of Pitchfork staff probably thinks I'm nuts. The darkness are from England and they wear things like open-chested catsuits and tight trousers. Sometimes these outfits are made of leather. Sometimes they have animal prints. The band members sport long hair and look like they stepped off the stage at Castle Donington circa 1980. To a lot of people, this means the darkness couldn't possibly be any good. Why is that? Why do people hate the 80s? Well, that's the very beginning of the 80s. It's the arse end of the 70s as he's talking about, isn't he? Mm. Besides looking silly... Or at least risking looking silly can only be good for a band like The Darkness. Big guitar rock, after all, used to be silly. It used to be pretty good too. ACDC Queen, Black Sabbath, Kiss, and Led Zeppelin were all absurd. Do you agree? I do agree with that, actually. Okay. So then, what do The Darkness sound like? Well, they're a blend of 70s pomp rock. Pomp rock? Pomp rock. I wonder what that is. 80s metal. And bombastic, sh- bombastic, <laughs> shiny arena rock. Yeah. yeah. I don't know what pomp rock is, but <laughs> I probably would but, like pomp rock, wouldn't I? Yeah, maybe you like pomp. Rock that's full of pomp and circumstance. Pomp. But I uh, do like pomp because you listen to like um, really like singer songwriting people. people. I do. You, <laughs> you love like folky singer songwriting. Like that's the thing I love so- more than anything. Yeah. But you do even listen to rock. Uh, <laughs> well, uh, no, I listen to lots of different. I listen to lots of different. <laughs> like the, the just coming no, down rapidly. Uh, I like listening to. Um, I like um, whenever I come back to ACDC, I always really enjoy it. I li- I've probably listened to Led Zeppelin more than anything else ever mm-hmm. in my career. I've always loved Queen, but I love Queen because it's eclectic and it is pomp. There is. It is pompous in places, isn't it? Um, that's not necessarily the bits that I like, though. Um, I think you like the more ballady Queen stuff, don't you? No, my, the Queen stuff I really love is uh, I love the whole of the jazz album, um, and I love the sort of interesting tracks where they've diversified their sound. And I, I even think there's bits on um, there's a song on Sheer Heart Attack that I think was written by. Uh, it might have been written by John Deacon, and like for me, when I listen to that, that's the sound of Queen actually inventing the whole of nineties indie. <laughs> you know, like they—they're they, just for me. That's like a groundbreaking band that just had four amazing songwriters in it. And you can listen to any one of those albums and get loads from it, and it's really eclectic and just a brilliant, fun thing to listen to. And I do listen to Queen albums top to bottom because that's how they're supposed to be listened to, I think. But um. Aerosmith, I was always a massive Aerosmith fan all the way through school. But if there was something, sometimes there's rock stuff that if it doesn't quite ring authentic, then I do reject it. I guess there's a lot of rock that just sounds the same. They're like the top. They each have a really distinctive sound. Well, rock's become this thing where there are a few sort of people who, who just tell you what's what real rock is. And it's got to be a certain way and it never really seems to break out. So there's a lot of stuff that sounds very, you know. Samey. Well, it's retrospective. 
you know, it's, and it doesn't, nobody's really pushing it forward. Or you don't often hear bands that are pushing it forward. Do you think you need to have a very unique vocalist to make it in rock? All those bands, the voice is very distinctive. I mean, it's not as bad as it was in the 90s. Like, um, if you go back and watch um, any Scream movie, you get like, um, you get the Red Right Hand. That's the song that's often there. Have you watched Scream lately? So you get a bit of Nick Cave, but there's always like whatever the Seattle kind of uh, grungy rock band du jour is doing like a song in the outro or at the beginning. People sing like this. <laughs> Stone Temple Pilots. Yeah, like like the Stone Temple Pilots, but sometimes like like Stone Temple Pilots, but like if if you ordered Stone Temple Pilots from Wish, and then and then that's what you would get. <laughs> like it's like that. And there were so many bands that were doing that, and like that whole nineties movement when supposedly glam rock died off because it was too silly. To me now, the nineties sounds very silly indeed. It's all chin singers. It's all growly kind of chin singers, shitty. What's a chin singer? <laughs> I, I, I'll try and do it. Hang on a second. How, how do I? <laughs> Instead of like a, like you, you and I, like a, a handsome man of a chiselled jaw, like like this. What, look at this. Look at this visage here, singing forth with and you know, Bella. But no less. <laughs> like, are they little worms singing? Yeah, like they do look like worms, but in a jumper like this, singing like that because that's that's how they. I don't know. They did something. I'm sure Elizabeth Giroff would be able to tell us how those guys did it. But we used to call them chin singers because it sounded like the sat <laughs> the music was coming from out of their chin, which was back here somewhere. <laughs> um, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, I know what you're talking about. <laughs> I just, like, from the <laughs> really growling through the tune. Um, and there's a few exceptions to that, but there's so much of it that sounded like that. And for me, the 90s was the daftest period of time. It's like in Buffy, they always had a band play. Yeah. Buffy the Vampire Slayer on their stage at the end of every episode. Yeah. You don't never watch Buffy, did you? No. Yeah, but they'd have a... It was iconic. They always had a different same-sounding band at the end of every show. I think that's what put me off, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. that, that sort of iconography I can take it or leave it really but yeah I feel like uh, I feel like the 80s was very silly but the 90s was like come on guys who are you trying to who are you trying to fool yeah. here I guess it was grunge no I, I actually like a lot of grunge I think it's more like the way grunge in, infused rock like because I think like rock has always been rock in the 70s it was a certain kind of Perhaps it's a bit more country, rock and rolly, bluesy rock. Eighties, it was excess, excessy. Perhaps some synthesizer infused rock. Nineties, it was people taking themselves way too seriously with a jumper that didn't fit. Rock. How do you critique a rock band? What would you say? <laughs> what would you say? You sound too. Your riffs sound too much like every other riff. Yeah, give me a, give me a, give me a band to critique. Dirty Honey. They're pretty good, but you did them already. And what did I say? <laughs> They're like a conglomeration of all of the different various types of rock smashed into one. And he wears a hat. That's a nice thing. I did. I, I probably did mention the hat, didn't I? Uh, <laughs> I don't know if you did, but I think of them with the hat. But then it was like, but it's nothing new. But can it ever be anything new? Yeah. Can anything ever be new? You can listen to prog bands if you want new stuff and weird shit, but no one wants to listen to them. <laughs> <laughs> Polyphia's doing is totally new, isn't it? And yeah, but like I used to, I was really into prog rock for a while. Yeah. Uh, really into it. Well, because of all the but wizards like, and stuff. Not that type of prog rock, like just all instrumental rock. Yeah, like you'd, <laughs> <laughs> you'd like, God you'd is like an a... astronaut were my favorite, one of my favorite <laughs> bands. And they never really did well in Ireland and they resented Ireland for that. Mm. But they were really good. I've never heard but, of yeah, them. I don't think but you'd is, like that, is that a band that talks about like um, forest dwelling? Uh... They don't talk about anything. They've got no lyrics. <laughs> <laughs> but are they sort of trying to emote the, the, the feeling of, <laughs> of being a forest dwelling... Um... This God is an astronaut, not God's a forest dweller. He's got parked somewhere, though, isn't he? <laughs> Park where? Well, in, in a forest, probably. Space. 
I mean, when he comes back, I mean. Why would he come? God doesn't live on Earth. Oh, you're right. Yeah, he lives, he lives in space. He's made his own little pad, is not he? <laughs> he's forced all of us to live on it. I, mean, I think. So, what is the idea then that we're like, um, like a an elaborately? Oh, we're going uh, oh yes, perhaps. <laughs> 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 Let's not get theological on it. <laughs> God doesn't. Okay, let's put that. Forest. God doesn't live here. God, God probably won't be parking his spaceship in a forest at any point. That's what. Yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Or in a forest clearing, possibly. It depends how big his spaceship is, doesn't desert? it? Desert? Maybe in a desert, wouldn't it? That is the ultimate forest. Do you think God's a wizard? Is that why you're thinking this? Um, <laughs> I've yet to hear an argument that uh, dissuades me from my idea that God is a wizard. <laughs> Could be your new prog album. <laughs> God is a wizard. <laughs> God is a space, so is a space wizard a and he just parks in forests. <laughs> just looking for parking. Is the critique, it's nothing new, a valid critique? Well, I think that's probably one of the things that they were talking about with Slade and ACDC on that other thing. Like, but like, it, you wouldn't, would you go to a singer-songwriter, that's nothing new, you singing about you're being heartbroken broken as a critique. <laughs> oh. I wouldn't do that in an unsolicited way. No, but they they said... I, mean, I think I do, I do, having said that though, conversely, I would critique... And make a positive remark about a, a song being about something that's uh, some uncharted territory, especially lyrically. That's what I was excited about with the Post Malone. I thought because he's talking about those those chemicals that your body makes and him being addicted to it, and actually it being quite a personal account of this struggle. I thought that was going to be an interesting song, you know. But it wasn't. Well, no, because the music was just so wet you know it had there was nothing in there that made me want yeah it sounded like any other song well, I, was the, that, I mean the music was nothing new but i mean i know i suppose i did cri criticize that i suppose i did yeah uh, cause it, it i mean if it sounds like if something sounds super generic then yeah i think that's a fair criticism because aren't you obliged to at least make a song that's discernible from the other swathe of silty whatever type of music it might be you're obliged to do something that, that isn't exactly the same as everything else. Otherwise, why why would you bother? Yeah, well, I think, well, I always go back to the 1975, but the part of the band song, the lyrics, his lyrics are amazing. Yeah, incredible. Because he goes, I know some vaccinista tote bag chic baristas sitting east on a communista keister. It's incredible. Writing about their ejaculations. I like my man like I like my coffee full of soy milk. And, and so sweet it won't offend <laughs> anybody. While staining the pages of the nation as annex, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. yeah. Genius. Like they're proper lyrics. That's genius. And that's why they're the best. <laughs> that's actually why they're probably the preeminent art yeah. band of the world today. And then he goes, am I ironically woke, the butt of my joke, or am I just some post-coke average skinny bloke? They're all really good. Amazing. He's talking about it's just quit becoming sober or not being taking drugs anymore. <laughs> No, completely. I just think it's an excellent song written by someone who really knows how to write songs. But maybe people don't put enough effort into songwriting. Like the lyrics. Well, look, some, I mean, okay. Sorry, I just knocked over my <laughs> What did you just I do? I tried to put my feet up on a, on a music stand. It's like... <laughs> I'll try it again. Here we go. There you are. Do you think people don't critique lyrics enough i don't really feel like they do do they no because i think like i, I want to go back to what you're talking about with lewis capaldi's documentary because yeah. i'm really curious about what the layout was so it was lewis capaldi trying to write his follow-up yep and so he had two no mark fucking songwriter sitting there telling him what to do <laughs> Well, he was in the, there was a few different scenes. There was one, the one where he was like, people like things that sound, where he realized he did what you do, where it's like, oh, that actually sounds like another song. And it was his song that it sounded like. This is the thing. You have to have an obligation to do that. I call it phantom publishing. You've got to scan yeah. your memory banks and make sure you haven't inadvertently, subconsciously ripped something off. And if you Probably have, you have to ask yourself if you can live with that or not, and whether you think you're going to get sued. Those, those are your responsibilities as a songwriter in terms of originality, I think. 
But it was his own song that it reminded him of. So he wasn't going to get sued by himself. But, and that's when the manager was like, that's fine. And then... The, oh, that was the manager. Th- okay. Well, the manager said to him, no, people love stuff that sounds the same. I think it was the manager because he goes, you leave the songwriting to me and it's your job to make it a hit. Basically to the manager, it's your job to sell it. Yeah. And then I think Lewis was like, do you think I'll ever make a song as big as someone you loved or someone I loved or someone I used to love or whatever it's called? <laughs> and he's like, oh, I don't know. I don't think so. You know, I don't but, hey, that guy sounds it, really inspiring. Can I get him in on some of our darkness writing sessions? <laughs> <laughs> I bet he's got loads and of really the, positive things to say about us. And there was a few other scenes. He'd be like, uh, he'd, like, he'd be like um, why are you guys bothering? That's, that'd be yeah, it, wouldn't it? Like, well, just when you said everybody loves everything that sounds the same, it was like, Come, please. It's only because you're, people are, probably are open to something that's a bit different. I don't know. Maybe they're not. But, but he did have a, some songwriters in there. And then he went to L.A., and then he was with a female and a male songwriter. Because when he was in the UK, he just was surrounded by male songwriters. And I was like, mm. not that I'm like, oh, there needs to be women. But the men, they were just coming up with just, sometimes I think women are quite good with words and <laughs> expressing themselves <laughs> maybe a bit more. I don't know about the gender divide, but I think, um, I just think that it's more a symptom of how we, how we create pop music that the lyric is an afterthought at best. I've been in situations myself where it's kind of like, um, you know, it's meaningless, trite nonsense. I mean, because a lot of the time when you do like a professional songwriting assignment, you'll go and what they'll want to hear is what they call song starts. And a song start is just a verse, a chorus and a middle eight. And based on that, they'll ask you whether they want, whether they, if they want you to expound, expound or extrapolate on those and make it into a real song, or they'll take it and the producer will extrapolate it and make it into a real song, or those song starts will be taken on by the artists themselves, and for them to earn their publishing money, they'll finish the song by writing the second verse. And to me, there's absolutely no way you can ever imagine expressing a heartfelt or emotional piece of prose by doing that like an abbreviated an abridged kind of micro not even an arrangement just three different elements that you're presenting to somebody it's like that isn't songwriting that's not that's not how fucking queen writes songs is it they don't go here yeah, lads uh i've got this bridge this verse and this chorus what do you think should we swap them around and all that sort of stuff and for them to actually be able to to be like um interchangeable and modular in the way that you often are expected to provide things you know to be i mean they might even say to you like we're looking for stuff that's around about 124 bpm i've had this before 124 bpm they've told me the key they want to hear a verse a bridge and um when they say bridge they mean middle eight and a chorus and it's like there is no way anybody's ever going to write a song with that criteria that means anything to anybody. But is it just because you need more verses? I think it's just because if you're writing a song, I mean, if you're writing a song that's designed to be, where they take the bridge from that one, the verse from that one, and then add a third chorus from a different writer, and this, oh, yeah. that's how these writing assignments work, it'll be like, this patchwork song can only ever be meaningless. Yeah. It, can, it has to be completely soulless. I don't know how they do it. Because even when I was like, when I, I when I go away, I write, but I don't even turn them into songs. They're probably just poems. But poems, you're trying to express a something. Poem, yeah, a poem is way more valuable than three random interchangeable elements of a song that some pop producer will butcher and glue back together. That's, yeah, that's, 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 that's what pop music is most of the time. And, that, and it only means that you can have really generic... Um, samey kind of uh, subject matters as well. It will end up being, "Ooh, baby, my heart is breaky because you le- le- left me lately," and uh, uh, you know, ba- oh, I'm going crazy. Oh, crazy and baby, that rhymes, doesn't it? No, they sort of rhyme. They have a Y. They don't they? rhyme. They have an A and a Y. 
I don't know what you're t- telling me. So does the word bay. <laughs> yeah, bay does have that. <laughs> it's crazy rhyme with bay. <laughs> Baby. Oh, it's got the same number of syllables well, and the last letter's the crazy? same. That means what, it rhymes. What would you rhyme with crazy? Lazy. That's it. Hazy. Does I have to? Have, but what about what about? Sometimes in lyrics, there's not always a rhyme. Even in good songs, even in songs that you probably think are great. Okay, I completely agree with that, and I know it's not necessary to rhyme things, but I think it should be nece- I think it should be a necessity to not rhyme baby with fucking crazy because so many people have done it in the last 20 years that's why it's my pet hate I just hear it in everything and I hate it I think a lot of you know the sort of criticism that you get in in terms of uh, like music journalism is Mm -hmm. often or it used to be it often used to be about what they thought was going to be successful so they were trying to sort of preempt you know, they're, they're, they're an extension of the A&R process, really, because they would listen to a thing and say, this is going to be a hit or this is not going to be a hit. And it would be less about why it's good or why it's bad, because beyond sort of comparing it to other things that it reminds you of, there's not much you can say about whether something's good or bad, because that's only ever going to be a subjective point of view, isn't it? So it's always about, I think this will be successful. I think this will appeal to the masses because of this. Um, so then you then it became like gambling. It's more or less trying to guess what's what. So does anybody ever really criticise anything? Well, what are they looking for? Are they looking... You say when you listen to something, it's because you want to be moved. But moved could also mean, as in, like, happy or... Tap, I don't know. Maybe there's two... Di- yeah, because I think, like, if I listen to ACDC, I still get the hairs on the back of my neck standing up. It really thrills me. And I can feel yeah. like I could just, I feel excited. Like I've just like, it really gets me going. I think sometimes you need to, from my experience, because I, you were brought up in a more musical household than me. I was stuck at literally FM 104, by the way. It's the radio station in Ireland. It was just whatever was popular, probably on Radio 1. And then, they, anyway, I didn't know how to listen to good music. Because it wasn't as, it wasn't bubblegum. It wasn't like just, you know, that beat, whatever, 124 BPM and someone saying the same word I'm used to hearing. Because that's just like... By the way, what word is that now? What do you think is the prevailing uh, trope that people use at the moment? Uh, there's a lot of female rage going on. Oh, there is. You know, like, there, yeah. don't want to be, you know, don't cross me or, you know forget you or I don't know miss miss you I don't know there's a lot of anyway I don't know what it is it's just but if it just sounds the same it's just it's more like we're a habitual creatures so if you hear the same thing it just becomes like when you're meditating you're saying a mantra it sends you into a weird little kind of like it just relaxes your mind but but you're saying that you hear the same words in lots of different songs or well when I was listening to music you start when you're developing your music taste I remember when I first heard like the Beatles or Led Zeppelin, I thought it sounded really far away. I think I told you that before, because the production's older. It's done differently. It's not like that massively. It's not. It's oh sounded... yeah, I mean, I think that's. No, I don't. I don't feel like that as much because I've listened to all this music. It's quite interesting that you say far away because I think you're talking about how the vocals treat it, aren't you? Yeah, probably. And I was like, oh, this doesn't sound like it's not fed into my like brain too loud because i think when uh, nowadays everything's super compressed you can hear every kind of nuance and syllable and kind of bit of spittle that falls out of the singer's mouth it also all sounds the same because it's been tuned in the same way yeah computers have changed it i had to listen i remember listening trying to listen to the beatles and i was really working hard to listen to it because i didn't have music my mum used to listen to leonard cohen in the car and that's a difficult thing for like a 12 year old to listen to (laughs) It's like, that's like an old man talk singing and I was like I can't yeah but then when you get to 14 it makes perfect sense <laughs> but I think people who listen to mainstream music aren't necessarily listening listening it's just kind do, of do you think it, people don't music, listen with a critical ear then I think the music's going in but are they listening I think uh, you know they talk about active listening in like relationships as well where you're lis- actually listening you're not just hearing hearing and listening are two different things aren't they 
What, what hearing, was that? You're that? Listening, I, don't, I didn't well, catch that well, last You can hear the noise. <laughs> The sounds, the sounds that you you're can, creating, yeah. yeah. I've, I've heard a lot of sounds. Yeah, yeah. I know what you mean. What did? So you're saying that there's. So it's the difference between hearing just music. yeah some sound that's yeah. in your brain and then, like, and then some stuff that you're actually paying attention to basically isn't it? Yeah, like you're listening, like you're listening to what the guitars are doing, or and then you're listening to what the vocals are doing. Listening to the changes, you have to tune your ear, kind of train your ear, I guess. Yeah, and it helps to have a bit of a vocabulary about it as well, because um, one of the really satisfying things about listening to music properly is talking about it to other people that listen to it properly. Like mm. if you've, because if you listen to, like, and I always, I always think that kids hear different things, in like they'll, um, they'll notice. Um, bits in a more like I'm, I'm thinking more about like um stuff that was probably recorded in the 70s on expensive mixing desks and like much more um a much wider palette of instruments and stuff that was dissonant naturally because it wasn't created by a synthesizer you know if you get anything that involves chromatic percussion or any sort of brass section woodwinds and all that sort of stuff in in like the realms of rock and and country rock and stuff like that if you if you play that to a kid they'll they'll start they sometimes like a, oh i like that whatever that instrument's doing and then you, you ask them to sort of think to express what part they're talking about and they start singing the third bassoon part or something like that and it's weird how i think it's a bit like um the way opinions are formed you know like if, uh, when a child suddenly starts telling you that they prefer bananas to oranges or something like that and you don't know where that's coming from but i think they just perceive everything in a in a totally different way to grown-ups and i and i love i love the idea of of um encouraging active listening in in younger folks so they can actually you know determine what's doing what why it's doing that how it relationally is affected by the other instruments around it and actually appreciate why some music is great and some music was just made by cynical people on laptops that rhyme baby with crazy. Bless you. Yeah. I remember when I was 14, I used to only really listen to guitar solos. So I used to go around schoolyard singing guitar solos. You can ask my friend Nicole. She's like... No, I believe you. And I liked vocalists with high voices. Correct. But I Correct choice. Wouldn't know what they were saying. I never listened Is that to because lyrics. you were rebelling against it? Everybody knows that the <laughs> yeah, dust is loaded. Like, Have a nice day at school. Thanks, Mum. Everybody knows. But even like Chester and Lincoln Park had quite a high range as well. And Compared I, to I, Leonard I, Cohen, yeah, definitely. But I would never... I listen to the same music. Sometimes I go back and go, well, I'll listen to the albums I listened to when I was 14. I'm like, oh my God, I know what the lyrics are. Like my adult brain now listens to the lyrics, but... And I used to sing the lyrics when I was a teenager, but still never processed that, that they were actually sentences. Mm -hmm. Like I'd sing the words and they never really. My, I, when I was um, <clears throat> very oh. young, I used to listen to stuff like ABBA and I didn't have, this is pre, this is just post recorded music, very much pre internet. Um, so it was in the eighties. And um, so I would listen to an ABBA song and I would try and decipher the lyrics, which seems like an easy task now. But I was getting it badly wrong because I was trying to create a poem and a story that made sense to me. And I was missing out all the nuances and the stuff that was about divorce and stuff because it was not, well, that wasn't something that would affect me for another 30 years, 40 years. And um, so I was just making up my own shit and getting it badly wrong. And I had them all on a ball, ball clip just pinned to my wall and I'd listen to it and I'd go over it and I was like yep I've definitely got that right that's definitely right and then when I found out later how badly wrong I'd got it having double checked it and proofread it and done everything I was I was I don't know I think maybe that's what used to be great about music maybe is is it you know the mumbling singers and people who didn't enunciate accurately gave you an opportunity to tell your own story in those songs yeah. Or if but, you had a weird uh, accent. I mean, that's what that's one of the things that I think Radiohead was brilliant for. But now it's the information age. There is there is no, absolutely no 
margin for error. I mean, obviously, the people that provide lyric matches and stuff like that often get my stuff wrong and make me look like a fucking prick. <laughs> but I guess then with the critique thing, what are people critiquing when they say a song's good now? Is it just how much it makes you bop, how catchy it is? Is that the best thing about a song is how catchy it is? Well, those are the things that matter in pop music, isn't it? It being catchy. Is in it? making you bop. That's, those are the only two criteria, isn't it? I don't know. Is it? Is it just they want people to sing along? Sometimes you hear, like, um, you hear stuff and there's very, very obviously mnemonic stuff in there designed to be sung on terraces at football matches. Yeah. When I hear those, I think that that wasn't what White Stripes were doing when they came up with Seven Nation Army. That's just a thing that happened because it's amazing. Yeah, I don't think they even probably even tried to make it. Kind no, of. That, I'm sure they didn't. It's just a brilliant riff that ended up being something that everybody sang. Yeah. At the darts or at the football or whatever. It was, it was at the darts for sure. <laughs> Why does darts co op the weirdest things? <laughs> they just take stuff and then they make it darts. <laughs> but what about a good song that isn't pop music? It can't. It has to have some sort of melody that moves you, right? Does it? Even Leonard Cohen stuff has a. There's something about it. No, but Leonard Cohen stuff is is ingenious, isn't it? Yeah. Like yeah. right across the board, top top to bottom, is just genius. I don't think we're talking about Leonard Cohen when we're talking about pop music, are we? No, but even let's say Paul McCartney's solo stuff or something. Yeah, of which some of it's it my favourite music catchy? ever. And is it it being catchy or what? What about a melody that's good? What makes a melody good? Yeah. That is a good question. <laughs> no more lonely nights, never be another. Remember that one? Yeah. That's such a great song, and I reckon it's great because. When Paul McCartney writes a, a melody, I think he chooses to weave one through really interesting aspects of the chords that are the accompaniment. Like he might sing through a ninth, he might sing through a major seventh, he'll do stuff that's not basically the, 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 the normal sort of triad of elements of a chord. And that's what makes him interesting and a cut above most of the top liners that are operating in the pop world today. And I say most because there's probably one or two that, that can do it well. Is a top liner a melody writer? Yeah. Sometimes you have like um, somebody will be creating the beats, um, which usually means the accompaniment, which usually means <laughs> uh, the same <laughs> fucking four chords that's in every single song on in the charts. Um, nothing terribly interesting. They might have like a funny sound effect or something that, that differentiates it from the other stuff. And then a top liner's job will be to make that into a hit that people can sing along to with a really straightforward um, lyrical conceit, um, some unimaginative um, melodic uh, choices that thread their way through either the third, fifth, or root of of like uh, the 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 four chords presented to them. Um, the key will seldom change. It'll just be something that's sympathetic to whatever the artist happens to be capable of, whatever their most comfortable range is. It'd probably be a, like an octave and a half somewhere in the upper mids if it's a bloke. And um, but I think what Paul McCartney does is like um, find much more interesting melodic paths. Through the chords, and even I if, don't you get, know how people... if you gave he gave Paul McCartney a generic chord sequence, he'll write something really, really interesting. He'd be a, he'd be the world's most amazing top liner, and music would become interesting again, probably. So, why are people okay with? Because when I was a teenager, and even now, 
I knew more than four chords and I, and I used to try and write songs. But I thought this is just what every I was too harsh on myself. I was like, oh, it's just everyone's used these four chords. I'm not smart enough to write anything. Like I was so harsh. I always wanted something to be different, like to the extent that I just ended up not writing anything because I was like, it's all been done before. <laughs> Someone's used these three chords before. But then like everyone's done this and made millions from <laughs> How are they OK with just how are they OK with it? What make, how are they inspired by their own work? I don't know. There's a lot of things that we've covered on the channel, I think, that, that fall into that, that you know, that demand that question, really. Like, how, how can they be okay with just that? You know, it's so boring. Like, I can't do it because I just don't have the musical knowledge. So I would, if I knew more chords, I would use them. <laughs> if I really wanted to write music, I don't even know the chords I'm playing when I'm writing music. I'm just moving around the fretboard. I don't know what I'm doing, and I just want something to sound interesting. And sometimes I do write something that sounds interesting, and then I forget it. <laughs> sometimes things do. sound too interesting, don't they? Yeah. You know, like it goes too far the other direction. It's, it's got to be justified somehow. I think the key to it is what the melody's up to. You know, if you can find an interesting way to thread a melody through the same four chords that everyone else is using, you're onto a winner. Do you think the chords or the melody should come first? Hmm. I really don't know. I think the person to ask is Brian Wilson, <laughs> if he have to tell you, from the Beach Boys. I think if you, I think it's more interesting if someone comes up with a melody on their own without any musical instrument. Yeah, but it gets, it has to be accompanied, doesn't it? It, has to, it needs to have an accompaniment to contextualise it, otherwise you don't know what they're doing. Oh, yeah. Oh, what do you mean you don't know what you're doing? I could sing anything, it could sound interesting, but what the fuck am I singing? I can anything. <laughs> Why is it going to be make it sound by? interesting, but what the fuck am I doing? <laughs> That's jazz. <laughs> Jazz, I don't think. You know what I mean. <laughs> I don't know, actually, I'm not sure if I know what I mean. To be honest, <laughs> that's jazz. All these jazz people are like, that's definitely not jazz. <laughs> yeah, that's definitely. <laughs> Apologies to anybody who <laughs> would be offended by uh, what I just dismissively referred to as jazz. That's certainly not what that was. Um, but it was jazzy. I think you'll agree, right? <laughs> <laughs> All right, as this then, this is pop music. <laughs> Baby crazy, I'm baby crazy, I'm baby crazy. But what about Capaldi's new song? Has that got baby crazy in it? No, but I actually can't remember how it goes. Well, you almost completely laid into him for going major to minor. Oh, I hate that though. But then he had the ninth. I feel like you were lying, but whatever. No, no, I don't mind it when it's got the ninth. I'll show you the difference. Right, so but just avoided it anyway. Um, okay, so go okay, creep radiohead goes G B C C minor. That's okay. But it's more like when you get those things where um And it happens at the end of a sequence um, to add some sort of fake poignancy. And you just mm. hear it so often. Like with, with, with Creep, it's different because it's sort of, it's leading you into something. But when you hear it at the end of a chorus, for me, it's like, oh, a sad resolution to, you know, it just, it's, it just adds a, it's such a shimmery kind of pop writer poignancy thing to it that rings super hollow mm. um, and, it, and it's one of the things that I dislike because there's a million ways to skin that cat if you wanted to do something that had sort of a lot of the same melodic elements you'd go from like say for it's, it's D D minor you could do D to F and some of that stuff still in there like the F would, the root of the F would be doing what the minor third would be doing on the thing now, there's some really obvious alternative choices or well, how about this how about write something that genuinely is heartfelt and poignant so you don't need to rely on those tropes, you know? 
and then you can use those you tropes in more more interesting sad. ways and and like the thing is like it's just the, the the thing that gives it the illusion of creating sadness is because it goes from like, like in the case of a d that's an f sharp to an f so it's a descending thing by one semitone which kind of I don't know, it's supposed to emotionally pull you down a little bit and make you go, oh, oh no, that's got me thinking, you know. But actually, how about, how about this, the reason why I, I don't mind it when it has the, the ninth is because that, that's a rising inflection from... Or the sixth or whatever that is. Yeah. Yeah, it goes to six. Has the has the um, has the six in there, which goes from the fifth to the sixth, so it, it rises, and at least it kind of gives you a bit of, you know, you can do something else with it lyrically, automatically. And it's not mm. just going, oh, here's the bit where you go boo hoo because it's gone like that. And at best, it's um, it can be really emotive, and at worst, it just sounds like cliche. Yeah, exactly. I think that's what it is. Yeah, but one of, one, one of the cool things is to do it the other direction. When you hear people go from minor to to major, there's some good stuff. Like even like on the old Belinda Carlisle records, there's moments like that, and you just think, "Oh, that's really cool." Actually, do it in the other direction makes you happy <laughs> somehow. <laughs> I don't know. Um, what about when people critique your live performances? Do you get nervous? You mean like a gig review? Yeah, or even the crowd. Yeah. If you're like, oh, what if they think I'm bad? Yeah. Is it, that's <laughs> it. I had one situation when we were playing with Guns N' Roses in uh, Litzegrund, which is the big stadium here in Switzerland, in Zurich. And um, obviously we're not Guns N' Roses, and that was disappointing to this one particular audience member who was really laying into me. So, but unfortunately for him, I had a microphone. I started laying into him, and he was just standing there like this. And I was right on the edge of the stage just pointing at him going, you fucking prick, of course we're not fucking Guns N' Roses. Our job is to fucking open up and it's people like you to make our job. You know, and I just went went for him and um, I wasted four or five minutes of the set just shouting at this one particular guy. And there was 100,000 like, other people in the room that didn't mind what we were doing. <laughs> I completely wasted my... So you so you did you do take it personally? Of course I take it personally. I'm out there living each day blind. Ah, oh, oh, was it... <laughs> Arse out. <laughs> <laughs> my ass hanging out. Hey, no, what, what was it? No, ass. What's the thing that people say? About arsing, living, arsing, around? arsing around. I'm out there arsing around, night in, it's night out. I mean, uh, come on. I mean, it's like no, it's impossible to not take that. That. What about at Ed Sheeran when when they're all looking at you, gawping? Yeah, they were like mouth agape. Some some people were like, uh, so so this is the barrier <laughs> during an Ed Sheeran gig. They see us and then. Uh, we start playing our rock music and I start screeching into the microphone and this, some girl's like, oh, oh. Yeah, but I did spot the girl that had her um, sexuality awakened as well. Well, yeah, they're all like, oh, Ed Sheeran, but then, you know, there's always one or two who I haven't seen a man of like you. <laughs> um, and the eyes are like, there's like awakening something in them. They're seeing a version of masculinity that they haven't. They used to watch an Ed Sheeran, who's a dude in t-shirt, jeans. I have. I took a picture of the t of the girl. Yeah, she but I like, maybe you could use that. And oh, no, that's not fair. Is it? And I, I don't know what you mean by. What do you mean? Please uh, expound on the, well, the ones that like, notion oh, that like I'm a different type of man to Ed Sheeran. I'm exactly the same type of man as Ed Sheeran. But you perform. You're performing masculinity in a different way. Not necessarily in the boy next door way, in the more like, I don't know, feminine, androgynous, something else. Oh, I thought you were going to say something else then. What do you think I was going to say? More like a powerful, glistening um, sort of model type from one of those Coca-Cola commercials from the <laughs> mid-80s. But you know, like it's a different type of performance. You're exuding a different type of energy that some people don't realise that actually maybe that's the energy that they're attracted to. It can be sexual, but I also think it's just a sense of power that people have in them. I think people confuse sexuality and that energy within them because it's a way of expressing that energy, but it's not necessarily, it doesn't need to You end. mean my power or their power? It's probably this, just it's the type of energy that they relate to maybe or that ignites something in them. 
different types of people ignite different things in you, I guess. It doesn't, and you can funnel it into sexuality or sex, but it doesn't have to go that way. No. But It's nice when it does, though, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, you know, mm. that's, people like that. Like, I like watching, like, Eric Nally perform. He, like, when I watch him perform, it makes me feel more powerful. Mm. Because I feel like he's performing a version of me that I wish I could perform, but I'm, I'm not on stage. I'm just like sat. But he's fearless, isn't he? So I think people, anybody who sort of goes to a Foxy Shazam show and and, and perhaps they, I don't know, I suppose he's inspiring if you have inhibitions. <laughs> I guess he's completely yeah. devoid of or that. Or even if it's like just... Because everyone, not everyone's the same and then some people reflect a version of you that isn't, you know... Not everyone has the stage to perform that version of themselves, you know. So they might be perf you know, seeing some version or some version of you in that person. Or it could ignite that part of you in you. So when you go to be creative, you know, you see that as a, an, a, an opportunity. Yeah, that's <laughs> another way to glean influence from a thing without just basically copying it, isn't it? Yeah. So like some people see Ed Sheeran and they're like, yeah, that's, I can just see myself in him and so when I go to be creative I can see that outlet but then some people that watch Ed Sheeran and it's like doesn't do anything for them doesn't ignite anything he must be igniting something in a, a lot of people but is that a criticism in itself though because what can you do about that like if you're saying if you say to an artist all right I'm I'm at the show I came I've been to see the show gave it a chance but nothing you did resonated with me emotionally and I didn't feel anything I didn't feel anything, I didn't feel empowered by it. I didn't feel, it just left me cold. What are you supposed to do with that? I think that's a more reasonable critique. If you say it didn't resonate with me, it's like, okay, but it resonated with the person next to them. But isn't the whole point of criticism that it's designed to help you or at least give you the option to sort of change what you're doing? That's why people talk about constructive criticism, don't they? And, and sort of just... Well, maybe if someone's like bad, so like if you play performed and it's like you didn't look at the audience, you didn't engage with them, like you were out of tune half the time. <laughs> Your rhythm's really bad, you need to work on that. <laughs> like you're singing not... Go on and say those things to me and I'll, I'll react to them open-heartedly. Say all those okay. things to me. You didn't engage with the audience, you weren't making eye contact with them or looking at I was at trying them. to, but uh, they were ugly. I'll try that again. Sorry, no, sorry. <laughs> go again, go again. I'll, I'll react. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> That's your response. Okay. <laughs> okay. No, no. Let, let's go through the list and I'll, I'll see if okay. I can. It didn't resonate. You, you didn't perform well tonight. You didn't engage with the audience. So you weren't present with them. You weren't looking at them. No, no, because I I was looking at them, but um, I've just got this... Uh, got like a thing in my retinas there's there's two holes at the back of them and i need to get that sorted out because it doesn't it's difficult for me to fix a gaze and, and i know it's natural to do that but i just I, i'm not comfortable keeping my eyes open for that long i just wanted to close them and and and, and you know just enjoy the moment of, of I mean, you need to do something that makes them feel connected to you in some other way then. Uh, okay um what about if i okay maybe i'll just tell like some really really personal overshare some personal stories from my yeah. life in between the songs would that be a thing yeah that sounds good okay so tell them about the holes in your eyes yeah that you're refusing to get fixed and looked at yeah it's all right. and you're slowly actually going blind yeah but slowly <laughs> <laughs> or just <laughs> put like fake glasses on that have eyes on them <laughs> 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 but, but like the hologram ones, so regardless yeah. of where you're looking at me from, it always looks like I'm looking at you. Then I'll be like able to engage least. with the whole audience. At once. Yeah, and then a s problem solved. Okay, so we're going to get some, we're going to design some singing glasses yeah. with like the hologram on that makes it look like the the eyes are following you around. So follow eye. Like the Mona Lisa. Yeah. Singing glasses. I'll put in brackets Mona Lisa style. <laughs> All right. Okay, so that's good because that's an example of some actually negative criticism, and I've and we've now found a way around it. So, what's the next one? You're singing out of tune half the time. 
See, if somebody said that to me, I'd be like, cool. <laughs> that means the other half I was in tune. <laughs> Yeah, but it did affect the enjoyment of the gig because it was a bit painful. Okay, it? well, let me ask you this. Was it sharp or was it flat? You were flat. Oh, I'm probably... Well, it could be a few things. I might be tired um, or I think it could be because I can't hear my... No, wait. Maybe my vocal was too loud in the mix. So it made you go flat. Pardon? That makes you go flat. I think it does because you're singing... Everything you're doing is like coming back at you so loud. It's kind of you back off from it a bit, and and sometimes the effort that you need to get to the notes is absent, okay. and you can't hear the backing track, so you don't know, you can't pitch it. If it's sharp, I think that's usually because you can't hear yourself well enough, and you can hear the track too loud, or you can hear the band too loud. So I'm going to talk to the monitor engineer and see if I can. No, if it's because I'm tired, I'll factor in an extra nap. So we'll do an extra naps. Yeah, maybe learn to sleep at night as well. I'll sleep at night and I'll nap in the day. <laughs> um, and I'll ask the monitor engineer to turn my vocal down a bit on stage and then see if that helps with the pitching. Is, would that be all right? Well, we'll see. Which bits was I in tune for? The, the ballads or the... <laughs> Every second line. Ah, okay. <laughs> that sounds like it could be a tiredness thing then. Mm. Yeah, you need to get more sleep. I mean, if you'd have said like you, you sounded a bit sharper on the choruses, that's probably because like Excited. when the guitars came in, I had to raise my game to get myself heard, and that's that made me a bit sharper. But but it sounds like it's just a tiredness. So I'll, I'll sort out the nap situation and make sure I sleep at night. Cool. What's the next one? Uh, your rhythm was a bit off, so it, it felt like you, you were coming in at the wrong points in the song. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like Bon Jovi. <laughs> I don't like Bon. So wait a minute, Bon Jovi doesn't come in at the wrong time, does he? <laughs> when we in the last performance, you know the way it was like, whoa, yeah. Halfway. There. Oh, like, halfway. Late. There. Late. Whoa. Living on so a prayer. Like, I believe in Think of Love. And then you were just like a bit like a half second behind them. But that's what people my age do. You know, we, we delay. We mm -hmm. delay the delivery because it sort of staggers it a bit and it gives the audience a chance to sing it and then you're like coming in. and over. So then like this, the, the crowd does it and then you're like, ah, this is how it should be done. Just... No? It was confusing. Was it? Okay, well, I didn't mean to confuse anybody, and I do apologise for that. So what I'm going to do is um, I'll sing it just like the record. Yeah. Every night. Okay. <laughs> no going off piece. <laughs> or no, just like... No expressing myself. Time. Okay, that's fine. We'll do it. We'll do it the way... It can be different. The way I did it that one time in 2001 when we recorded that song, that's how I'll do it. From now until the end of time, I won't allow the song to evolve in any way. Can you get the polyp back on your vocal cord so it sounds the same as well? I'll do that, yeah. So <laughs> reapply polyp <laughs> I've put here. Your voice sounds too smooth now. <laughs> um, and never deviate from recorded version. <laughs> well, you're going too far with the... You're like critiquing my critique by being sarcastic. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is. I'm just giving an example of how artists okay, react if you to this sort to of thing. <laughs> like Bon Jovi does now, that's fine. Not like multi million selling. You know that his son is dating um, Molly, Millie Bobby Brown, who's 11 in Stranger Things. I don't know what any of those words mean. What's <laughs> you know, Stranger Things? Yep. You, you know the girl in it? The one that's got the nosebleeds? Yeah. Okay. She's engaged to John Bon Jovi or to Bon Jovi's son. That's one. I'm so happy for them both, actually. She's only 19. It's lovely. Anyway, wasn't really sure what was going on. No, 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 no. Who cares? Me. Okay. I'm, I'm, congratulations yeah. to all of the parties concerned and listed. It was just a, a tip bit. You know when you have a tip bit. <laughs> I love those bits. Yep. Yeah, let's do it. You hate my tip bit. Anytime I say a tip bit, you always dismiss me and my tip bit. No. Yeah. I did one the other day about a girl who DM'd me and you just didn't care. Like that face now where you're looking at me like. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying so hard. Wait. Go on, tell me that story again. This is the face you do. Tell me that story again. Which one? A any story. <clears throat> this girl slid into my DMs after our podcast. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What'd she say? She said. Wait, I'm going to write this down. <laughs> you know that there's a lot of, like there's a medium between 
and oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay so, all right so, so you're, now you're criticizing my ability to listen to yeah. the story okay so you know what you're too comfortable with me where you just stare at me like oh go I on try, try again try again tell me tell me a story I'll try Millie Bobby, Bobby Brown is engaged to John Bon Jovi's son Millie Bobby Brown Billy William Millie I thought you She's, said Billy Bobby Brown like like but William Robert Brown no, it's the girl in Stranger Things. Oh, right. I haven't seen all of Stranger I think I've seen like a couple of episodes. As soon as I realised it was about, you know, one other dimension. And it's just like normal life, but unfortunately there are some monsters. Just pretend you're on, like, like if you're on a date and you with a woman, you pretend great. You're really good at it. Yeah, 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 let's go, let's go. Hey. Hey, yeah, how you doing? You're hey. right, nice to see you, yeah. What, uh, did <laughs> well, it's nice that you brought a notepad to the date. Yeah, because uh, I think it's important to uh, just keep keep track of the lies that I'm telling you. <laughs> uh, okay, so do uh, let's. I'll try and let's get this right. Go on. I'm critiquing all of you right now. <laughs> I know, which is great, and and I'm really enjoying it. But go on, so tell me, t- tell me a story about some stuff that I don't care about, and I'll try and make it seem like I care. Go on. Um, well, anything to do with my life. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, do the do the Stranger Things one. Millie Bobby Brown got married. Okay, the John so Bobby. wait, wait. So it, presumably Millie is that short for Matilda, and is the Bobby Robert or Roberta Brown? Does that mean she'll be Millie Bobby Bon Jovi if they, if they get married? Yeah, she'll be Millie Bobby Bon Jovi. It's pretty cool, actually. That's a good handle. Millie what's, Bobby. What's Brian his name? Jovi. What's his name? John. I don't know what his name is. <sighs> But everyone's criticising her because she's only 19. Okay. It's quite young to get engaged, isn't it? <sighs> isn't it? I don't know. Is it different for child stars, though? People who have been in the public eye for that long. That's what someone else said. She's lived a life already. Mm. I wonder so. if that's part of it. I don't know. Son's Jacob. Jacob I think Bon Jovi. That's pretty cool. It's Jake Bon Jovi. Mm. Actually, I don't know which one she's engaged to. Oh. Really? Are they all? Are they all got J names? They just they just refer to him all the time as John Bon Jovi's son. <laughs> His name's Jake. His name's Jake. Okay, that's a good name, Jake Bon Jovi. Well done. You feigned enough enthusiasm there. I'm impressed. <sighs> that took everything I had, though. <laughs> <laughs> I really couldn't care less about that piece. Of, I, the it. thing is, I don't actually care either. But I like tidbits. Like a little nugget of information. Right? All right, give me another nugget of information. I don't know if I have any more of those. Oh, uh, no, they, they just they get inspired when you say, <laughs> don't do that. <laughs> no, I love tidbits as well. That's good. Okay, let's get back to your critiques. Right, go on. Well, they're your critiques. Your show wasn't good enough. Oh, yeah, but then you said the thing about getting the polyp back. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but you were talking about when something doesn't resonate with you, isn't that the whole point? But I'm No, saying- I was asking if that's like, if because it's not something, I mean, how do you, the kind of critic, because I think the problem with music is that it's so subjective and everything that you, every positive thing that you experience when you hear a song that you love is so personal to you that it's, you can't actually say to an artist, look, I would have found this much more moving if instead of about, you know, um, an old man dying, you'd have made it about like an old man dying and then as he sort of croaks his last death rattle, he rolls over and accidentally squishes his dog so that both him and the dog die. I would have found that <laughs> much more moving. <laughs> moving? Well, That's I'd have been moved to tears because it's two enough. things that have died. It's been twice as emotional for me because I like... But it's not moving. It's tragic. <laughs> yeah, but for me, it didn't resonate because it was just a guy dying. Well, how about a guy, and as he's dying, he fall, he rolls over and kills like a hamster or one of his pets of something. What's that going to make you feel like? Well, then I feel like it's not just the human tragedy and like the, the natural conclusion of of a life lived to its fullest. It's also like an innocent hamster that's died. <laughs> And then, like, my militant sort of veganism will kick know. in as well. And I'll be like, oh, my God, this is... But it's only a song, but it would it would move me. You can't... This is what I'm saying. My point being that you can't say that to an artist, can you? You can't give them pointers about what would make a song more 
enjoyable to you. So there's no such thing as constructive criticism when something's this subject, uh, subjective. So about the actual content of the song, there's no, there's <laughs> the lyrical content. There's no. You can't yeah, actually. and like I remember, like I've got a friend who said to me, um, you know, we've got a song called Open Fire. And then when the backing vocals come in, it's Dan and Frankie going, give me an open fire. And they do fire like that. And it's almost like one syllable word. Yeah. And my friend said to me, you know what? I reckon it'd be better if it was open fire. So we were dim, dim like that. And uh, I was like, yeah, that's a good bit of uh, criticism. Cool. I'll, I'll, I'll mention it to the guys. And you know what I did? Didn't mention it. I didn't do anything at all. I just left it the way it was because that's the song. Yep. <laughs> you know. Well... Yeah, because it didn't, he, also, that's a weird thing to, for someone to say to you, um, but like, I wouldn't tell you what to do in a song. Oh, yeah, in a song. <laughs> <laughs> you tell me to tell you what to do in other areas of your life, true, so I wouldn't tell you what to do. No, no, yeah. Um, but I'm talking, when we're talking about resonate, I said, isn't resonating the most, re the most valid critique you can have, Mike, can yeah, because it is the only thing that matters, you know, in terms of ha what happens when you listen to music. It should be the only thing that matters. It's not whether you think something's cool or not. It's whether it energizes you or makes you feel yeah. something, isn't it? Um, but that's also not a criticism that, or you know, the absence of that or, or even just declaring it as being the most emotionally sort of inspiring song you've ever heard. Neither of those things count as criticisms to me because I don't think you can actually change. You can't change real. that. You know. You can't. But it's the only real critique you can give someone. But because it's so subjective, there's absolutely no way for it to be valid. But now I'm thinking, does Ed Sheeran and Louis Capaldi, are they so famous because they they resonate with more people and like it? Are the most, because they're more normal. And then people who aren't like Ed Sheeran, maybe his stuff doesn't resonate with them. So they just find him very uninteresting. But obviously he's an incredible performer. Oh, that's a really interesting idea. Because, you know, like the whole thing we were talking about social media earlier yeah. and like um, an A&R department only being interested in your social media numbers. I think it's basically a popularity con contest and an outcast like myself, for example, who has a very selective audience. Mm. Um, because I'm not like a normal bloke, I guess, less, there's going to be fewer normal blokes that are interested in, yeah, um, you're or normal folks, to. rather. Normal folks are less inclined to, you know, there's probably a sliding scale to it, but they're going to be overall less inclined to socially interact on social media with a person that isn't exactly like them yeah or it doesn't there's a part of them doesn't represent a part of them so there's probably like builders who listen to your music and you represent a part of them that is in them but the whatever socially constructed version of their life they've now committed to they can't express that version of themselves so you are expressing that version of them for them and that's why they are inspired when they listen to your music you're welcome, builders. But there are probably only a smaller few. There's probably more people who feel more akin to Ed Sheeran. That's probably why he's so globally successful. Yeah. Though, then there's, I don't know, then how do you count for like a queen and Led Zeppelin, but maybe. Yeah, because, well, that's, that's, I think that's why I was trying to pull it back to social media, because I think before social media, it was an aspirational pastime yeah. where you're doing outlandish things and living a preposterous lifestyle and that was what we all wanted to do and now it's like you can only really find things that resonate with you if the person that you're watching is similar to you somehow is that yeah or it represents a form of escapism but i've realized millennials apparently don't have haven't discovered what their midlife crisis is yet because everyone above millennials or even you know the midlife crisis was them escaping normality. That's when why men would have a midlife crisis. They were like, oh my God, I've married, I have kids. Everything's, every day is the same. I do the nine to five. And then they have a midlife crisis. So they buy a sports car and have an affair with like a model or something because it's escaping from that. But millennials, we have no normality. 
We have no structure or security. None of us can afford houses. So we haven't even got to the point where we have a structured normal life to escape from. Every day is like scrabbling for chaos, through chaos, trying to figure out how to navigate everything that's changing so quickly. So we haven't, millennials don't know, haven't started having a midlife crisis. So that escapism stuff like Queen and all that <clears throat> isn't attractive because we're like, we're seeking normality. We're just really looking for some normality. Normality will be the, the midlife break from what you're used to, I suppose, wouldn't it? Right? Yeah, yeah it's a break from structure. <laughs> People used to go from being like kite surfing, bouldering uh, lunatics to just being a cashier in a <laughs> supermarket. Yeah. But it's just having an affair with uh <laughs> what would you what would be the opposite of Well no, just having a really normal monogamous vanilla relationship. Being a nun. <laughs> I don't know. I'm glad my generation did it the right way up. <laughs> yeah. Have you had your midlife crisis or? Uh, it's ongoing. Yeah. Right. Well, I think we've covered everything, don't you? Have we? Or have you got any more? Mm, I don't know. How would you conclude critique, criticism? How would? What are the tips for dealing with criticism from someone who's been in the trade? Oh, you know what? I think all of it hurts. You get to a point where you're so you're so used to having everything you don't you do shot down, or at least it feels like that. I mean, if you see a review where it's kind of like people are saying mostly nice things, and they say one shitty thing, that's the thing that haunts you. And I don't know why it's louder than everything else. Probably because it plays into your natural self-loathing or the imposter syndrome that you inevitably have in the early part of your career, because this is a ridiculous way to live your life and the idea that you're doing it for real never really sinks in. Um, so people, you know, negative comments like that can be really hurtful. So I think you really do have to find the discipline to ignore all of it. And I think for me, it took 15, maybe, maybe even longer than that years to get past that. And completely just feel completely disassociated with any of it. Like it doesn't matter to me at all. Now I don't care. I can genuinely say that. But in the olden days, you can't help but care because it's your. It is like your baby, isn't it? You're, you're creating something. You spend all that time on it. It comes from your heart. You put it out there. You throw it to the walls, and you watch it get savaged. It's just painful. It's really difficult to what. It's difficult to endure that. You know, there's a really great song by uh, Ron Sexsmith called uh, "This Song." Uh, it's from the album Blue Boy, and uh, I think he uses um, fatherhood and or being a parent as a as a, an allegory for writing a song. But he does it in a really amazing way. I recommend you listen to that song. Um, did I cover that on my Ron Sexsmith episode? Uh, yeah, I think so. I remember you talking about it. Brought a song into the world, just a melody with words. It trembles here before my eyes. How can a song survive? And this, yeah, it talks about they've all brought knives, came on, they've all brought knives. Anyway, there's loads of good stuff in there that's, that is saying the same thing that everyone says, really. But you just have to, you have to tune it all out, unfortunately. It's difficult to ride the hype and then see momentum gather because people are saying nice things and also ignore it at the same time. It's really impossible. I don't envy upcoming artists that have to put up with that. And I don't even, I don't think I even understand how the trade works in terms of promotions and where that criticism comes from. If it's just people on the internet, it, even that I find difficult not to engage with because they're just little shits. You know, someone says something shitty to you, and my inclination is always to be like, "Well, fucking come on, then," you know, <laughs> and then just like engage yeah, with it. Like and when we did the YouTube channel, even, even yeah. Like at the beginning of that, I was uh, you had to stop me from looking at the at the comments, didn't you? And actually, that's like um, I've only just gathered the strength, the requisite strength, to be able to enter that arena again. But it's always it always amounts to the same thing. It's not really a fair 
arena because like if somebody criticizes you and you bite back and you say oh hang on it's not not that's not on it's like oh you're a bit sensitive oh i'll get him and bags at dawn it's like you've just said something that's fucking personally insulting to me and then of course i've hit back because you're a fucking prick and i'm gonna tell you you know and then it's like and it's like oh he's oh he can't take what he dishes out can he oh you know <laughs> it's like that so then you're you're obliged to just steer clear of it really because there's no you have to stay out of it i have to stay out of it so i think that's that is my advice on criticism stay out keep out of don't, it don't look at the comments you even looked at the comments of the guardian article i didn't even go in there you went in there did i yeah you're like oh the comments in the guardian article i didn't even look i think they were good weren't they mostly yeah but I'm actually a bit. I'm actually a bit up. stronger now because if if there were some shitty ones, it's like okay, I just laugh at them. <laughs> but that's. Yeah. I think that's because I've been trained in the arena of YouTube. Actually, the YouTube has been really helpful to experience that. I mean, my Patreon is just full of people that appreciate what I'm doing and and support me as an artist and a, as an individual and all that stuff. And everybody's lovely. YouTube is the wolves t to an extent. You know, there's 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 going to be a bit of everything in in the. They're not even the worst, really. The worst is like TikTok and Facebook, and Facebook I think is actually a cesspit. <laughs> They're horrible on there. But what about comments like? And I don't want to hurt your feelings. Are you ready? Can I, don't, you? I can't hear you. What did you say? I don't, I'm gonna. What about comments? I don't. Where people go? Oh, I never used to like him, but I like him now. Well, I think I've come round to the point of view where it's just a case of if you like me or not. It's kind of, um, it's always a reciprocated thing. <laughs> if you declare any sort of liking for what we're doing here, I'm like, yep, I like you too. Nice. Because <laughs> it is, isn't it? Yeah. It's like... That's all I know about a person sometimes. Oh, I like what you're doing. Cool. I like you. But isn't it hard when you become famous and then the front man becomes a personality and then people decide whether they like the band based on whether they like the front man? Yeah, but that's your job, isn't it, as a front man? Yeah, but isn't, did you find that difficult? Because people would be like, I don't like him. But really, they don't know you. So what? they don't actually dislike you but different than our band because I think everyone's got got their favourites a lot of most of the time I think people would, would say that Dan was their favourite Frankie's a, a huge you know cult hero icon stuff it's more like the but, Spice Girls than you know <laughs> Colin Gemini and uh, uh, the Zodiacs or whatever you know? but yeah I never really imagined myself to be to have that sort of I think I could be quite abhorrent to a person as a personality and they still enjoy the band because there's other members of the band that are sort of iconic in different ways you know at a cult band level you yeah. know because i can be as you know maybe you don't like the way i walk or something like that but you might like uh, the way frankie points when he plays his bass and that sort of thing you know there's always something for everybody yeah. i know but the front men always get the harshest yeah i think that's true yeah. Because you're just the face. Yeah, but at the same time, you get a lot of the advantages as well. Like, um. Free stuff? You get a lot of free stuff. Well, I mean, not anymore, but they actually charge me extra now because I don't want to be a brand killer and try and dissuade me from <laughs> using <laughs> their products. Uh, how do you want to conclude it? Well, in conclusion, um, I think we should be very careful about how we. Um, administer critique and criticism especially in the artistic realms because people like myself and yourself even are very very sensitive you got, yeah. we're human beings and a lot of the time you're criticising things that we have no power to alter you know so it's really totally unfair like um, if criticism really mattered in the artistic realms then people who uh, you know, review albums and things would be invited to record sessions. They'd be part of some sort of focus group and they'd be involved in the creative process. But they aren't. And the reason why they aren't is because that would, that wouldn't be art. <laughs> you know, that would be as, you know, it would be art in the same sense that um, a focus group around Lewis Capaldi that are saying, oh, you know, it's good that you're doing the same song twice because people like familiarity and repetition. It's that level of cynicism. You know, artist has to come from the heart. Art has to come from an artist's heart, doesn't it? It needs to be um, a one-way expression. It goes outwards, 
like that. And I don't know, the more the more people that interfere with it who have no actual emotional connection to the thing that you're creating. But you're really just talking about their opinion, whether it's criticism or critique. And opinions are like assholes, and a lot of them stink. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> or something, I don't know. I'd say, well, creatives are the most sensitive people and yet they have to endure the most critique. That's a, that is sad, isn't it? Yeah. It would, I would find it hard. It's almost like you do this job to avoid that kind of stuff and then you get the most of it. It's bloody annoying. Yeah. Do you want to add anything in conclusion? I don't think so. I think I said a lot, didn't I? Yeah, you said a lot of cool stuff. It was really good. Mm. Shall I do the outro theme tune music song? Will you join me? <laughs> what about a little rap? <laughs> what? J to no. the U to the S to the T to the I N H A W K I N S. I'll do it on my burner account. What? On my special TikTok burner account. Oh yeah, okay, cool. Oh, it's on TikTok, is it? Justin Hawkins writes again. Don't upload something to one of my social media things, but <laughs> it'll be me singing and it's the other. <laughs> Hit an E for me. <laughs> nice. Still I did it. See, look, I know. Nailed it. I, I bet you didn't think I was going to hit me, right? No, I actually knew you were, but I didn't know if you'd go for a middle one or a high one. Surprised me with an upper mid. Lovely stuff. Good choice. Thanks. So, um, in conclusion, uh, this has been Justin Hawkins Rides Again, uh, The Jewels of Victory, Pitfalls of Music Trade, Criticism and Critique, featuring myself and Jenny Mae Finn. Uh, anything else that you'd like to add before we sign off? I don't think so. Be nice. <laughs> Be nice. Costs nothing. And means the world. Nice one, guys. <laughs> See you on the ice. Bye. Thank you so much for watching. Um, tell us what you thought in the uh, comments area down there. And uh, let's continue the conversation. Um, next week, we're back on Monday uh, with an episode about creative burnout and the songwriting process. Um, and you can listen to all this, uh, all this stuff on uh, Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Um, nice one, guys. See you on the ice. Adieu. Nice one. Yeah, cheers. Take it easy. Okay.